All day we've been hearing about pests on plants. Well, I'm going to talk about plants that are pests. But then at the very end, I'll bring it back around and I'll talk about pests on plants again. But I want to start um, by talking about um, the, the question that a lot of people have about cultivars of invasive species. And I want to start right off by thanking a plethora of co-authors and graduate students who have helped with this work. Um, what I'll be talking about is actually four different studies, and uh, the folks listed there are the ones who have made those happen. So I probably don't need to tell this audience that invasive species are bad, and they are threats to biodiversity, and they cause economic harm and environmental harm. Um, but many of our invasive plants do enter the country um, from the ornamental plant trade, horticulture in the broadest sense, and particularly woody invasives come in that way. Botanic gardens have been involved in this issue of invasive plants for many years. Uh, we recognize the role that we've played. Um, we're trying to be more responsible about what we bring in from other countries, what we display. Um, our garden and many others have signed these voluntary codes of conduct that uh, say that we'll be careful about what we import. If we know something is invasive, we'll no longer have it in our collection. When we teach classes, we'll talk about invasive species and so forth. You can look up the codes if you're interested. And we do annually review our collection. And if a new invasive or uh, comes into the area or if there's something that we've had a long time but it's beginning to act badly, then we'll talk about that and um, in many cases remove that from our collection. But one of the issues we've grappled with a lot is how do we deal with cultivars of invasive species? So we know that buckthorn is a problem. We know burning bush is a problem. We know barberry is a problem. But those plants have lots of different cultivars. And those cultivars may or may not resemble the parent species that's causing the biggest problem. They can vary a lot in how many seeds and fruits they produce. Um, and so when we list a parent species like barberry um, as an invasive species, do we automatically need to list all the cultivars? Um, and another cultivar issue that we um, run into a lot is the one uh, of sterility. And so many things have been marketed as sterile cultivars when in fact they're only self-incompatible, which means by themselves they don't set seed, but if there's an individual of a different genotype nearby, they can cross and set seed. So I'll, I'll talk further on both of these issues. And I'm picking on barberry, not because I necessarily dislike it, it's a lovely shrub, but I think it's really emblematic of this issue. Um, uh, on this side, you can see um, a blurb from a nursery catalog. The reasons you should grow barberry, sheer growability, hardy to zone four, can take sun or shade, wet or dry, will come back strong after a beating. <laughs> <laughs> I read something like that and I start to quake a little. Um, you know, this is something that has this broad ecological amplitude. It can grow anywhere. And it's something um, that I begin to get concerned about like the Connecticut Botanical Society, who talking about the very same species says one of the most destructive invasive plants in Connecticut. And so you have these two very different views about the same species. And I think part of the resistance in phasing out barberry and barberry cultivars is the financial incentive. Um, the nursery industry um, is uh, selling this plant in a lot of its beautiful cultivars and makes a lot of money doing so. And these nurseries can't just ax a crop and say, oh, we're not going to sell it anymore because they don't have that big of a profit margin. And this is a significant hit for them. And so um, we started uh, looking at barberry as an example and um, the fecundity variation in the cultivars of barberry. So this is something that some cultivars only set about 100 seeds per plant, some over 9,000. And talking with people in the nursery industry, they say, well, can't we recommend and continue to sell the ones that don't set many fruit? And that seems logical, right? 
that shouldn't be as invasive. Um, and some other things we heard um, were, I know barberries have become invasive, but mine doesn't really set any seed. My plants are two feet high after five years in the ground. They're not spreading in my garden. I don't believe they're spreading elsewhere. Um, another one is the only barberry plants we see invade are green. The purple-leaved barberries must be safe. So first, a couple important points from plant genetics about cultivars. Cultivars don't invade, unless they're spreading vegetatively, right? It's their offspring that invade. And the, the, the offspring of cultivars don't always look like mom and dad. So the fact that you don't see purple-leaved barberries in the woods, maybe that that's a recessive trait and the offspring are all green. And some crossing experiments have shown that that is in, in part true. And then also this point um, that I made earlier that self-incompatible is not the same as sterile. We've seen a lot of um, purple loosestrife cultivars marketed as sterile when in fact they're only self-incompatible. So we took a look at this, um, myself and uh, my colleague Tiffany Knight from Washington University, and we said, okay, it makes sense if a plant, um, you know, one is set setting 9,000 seeds per plant, another one 100. Is that safe? Where do you draw the line? And the way we did this was we took a demographic approach, and we asked, if a population is growing, at what point, when reducing fecundity, is it no longer growing? And so let's look at these two hypothetical cultivars here. And um, for all the plants that I show today, they'll have these life cycle diagrams. And this is a pretty simple one. It goes from a seedling. 5% of those become juveniles. 5% of those remain juveniles each year. 80% of the juveniles become adult. 95% of the adults stay adult, and they set 1,000 seeds, 10% of which germinate. And their population growth rate, this little lambda here stands for population growth rate, is 1.5, and that's really high. And so one is replacement rate, or zero population growth rate. Um, so if you're above one, you're growing. If you're 1.5, you're growing half again as much every year, so that's really fast. But just by tweaking a few parameters over here, okay, look at this number, we have a lot of plants in this hypothetical cultivar staying juvenile and not transitioning to adult as quickly, and we have them setting fewer seeds, and those tweaks make this cultivar safe. It's now, population growth rate is one, that's replacement rate, it's not spreading. And so this is the approach we took. And we used published demographic data on a variety of invasive species of different life forms, so some biennials, some monocarpic perennials, things that live several years, flower once and die, um, some perennials, and then some woody plants. And let's look at an example from the short-lived species. This is garlic mustard. I'm sure many are familiar. <laughs> and here's the life cycle diagram for garlic mustard. And these are the transitions. So from a seed in the soil, only 3% become rosettes. 62% of those become adults. A few revert, actually, to rosette. Um, and then 27% uh, of the adults set seed and return seed to the seed bank. These numbers in blue are what are called um, the sensitivities to those transitions or the elasticities of those transitions. And it's just a way to tell which one of those transitions is driving population growth rate. And so in our, our case here, the highest number is this transition from rosette to adult. And so that's what's driving population growth rate, but the 0.09 here, seed set is also important, as is this transition back to uh, rosette. So garlic mustard has a population growth rate of 1.42 under normal conditions. 
Now, if we just cut that um, transition from adult to seed down, so if we're making it set less seed in our models, this is what happens. So we started at 1.42, 20% reduction in seed. We're still above the magic one. Somewhere around 50% reduction of seed. That line crosses, and we now have populations that are shrinking instead of expanding. And so in this short-lived short species, if we reduce fecundity by 50%, we no longer have a problem plant. That's what I just said. <laughs> um, but what about long-lived species? Are they the same? And so um, this is our typical long-lived species, a much more complex um, life cycle. So we have seed, seedling, juvenile, small adult, medium adult, large adult, extra large adult. Um, and I'm not showing all these transitions, but the one that I, I really want you to look at, or the two here, are, this is the transition in, in fecundity, 0.01, and this is the survival of the extra large adults, 0.11, that was the highest, that was the lowest. So what's driving population growth rate in this long-lived plant is survival of the adults. Really doesn't matter how much they set seed. That's not driving um, lambda. And so, what that looks like when we cut seed down, <laughs> seed set down, is until we're completely sterile, we don't have a plant that's no longer spreading. What's driving the population growth rate? Survival of the adults. So here are all the lines <coughs> divided into our short-lived species that uh, only set seed once, uh, perennial, short-lived perennials, and long-lived perennials, um, shrubs, trees. And what you can see is the same thing happening again and again. If you're an annual or a biennial, you reduce fecundity, that affects population growth rate. If you're long-lived species, fecundity has very little effect. These are those elasticities, those blue numbers, how sensitive Again, um, if you're an annual, you're very sensitive to fecundity, and if you're long-lived, you're much less sensitive to fecundity. So what this tells us is, for many of the invasive species that we're concerned about, buckthorn, burning bush, barberry, um, even perennial, long-lived perennial things like miscanthus grass, um, you really have to be sterile to be called safe. The other thing this tells us is we can use these demographic models to think about control. So with something like garlic mustard, preventing the transition from juvenile to adult is very important, as well as getting them before they set seed, mowing them down before they set seed. What it tells us for long-lived species, our woody invaders, Getting rid of those long, those large adults is the most important thing we can do to slow down population growth rate. <coughs> so now I'm going to give you an example of how we applied this at the garden to a plant that we had in our collection, and we had a lot of cultivars of it, and we weren't sure how to handle it, and so what our invasive committee had said is this is a plant that we're going to evaluate. We're going to determine if these cultivars are as problematic as the wild-type species. This is uh, Miscanthus sinensis, or Chinese maiden grass. Um, lots of cultivars. Um, you may have seen them, some of them variegated. These nice plumes in the fall. Um, and a graduate student um, did this for his master's thesis. And because of the modeling work, we were able to say, that the only cultivars we're going to retain in our collection are those that are sterile in our climate, those that don't set seed in our growing season. And so we grew them. Um, that's Glenn, the graduate student. That's Tiffany, who did the modeling with me. Um, grew up all these cultivars side by side in a common environment. 
We pulled off their inflorescences and x-rayed them because if you've ever tried to count the seed of miscanthus, even if you're a grad student, <laughs> it's really hard. But this wasn't so bad. Um, those little white blobs are filled seeds. And so they lit right up for us and we could count them pretty easily on these um, pictures. And we had two different people count and if the results were wildly different, we redid them and we averaged them and so forth. And here were our results. So, from the worst actor, Klein Silberspin, 191,000 seeds per plant. <laughs> um, and a lot of them, very fecund. But some not so much. And we had three that were completely sterile for us. Um, Hinja, Silberfiel, and Miscanthus gig giganteus, which is the hybrid that's being used in biofuel development. Also cabaret, but most of them died, so we don't count it anymore. <laughs> so um, what we did is we said those are the three that we will continue to grow and feel okay about um, at the garden. Uh, cabaret, because it wasn't hardy in our climate, um, we did not recommend. We do say there are a couple caveats to this. The three that didn't set seed may not have set seed because of the length of our growing season. And as that extends with climate change, we may see them setting seed in the future. So that's something um, we're going to keep an eye on. So take home messages for long lived plants, perennials, woody species. If you want to call a cultivar safe, it should really be sterile, completely sterile. Um, what this meant for us is when we're evaluating cultivars and deciding whether or not to keep them in our collection, it became really easy all of a sudden. <laughs> Do they set seed? Don't they? If they don't, um, we're okay with keeping them. And if they do, uh, we move them on out. So now back to the pest on plant part. <laughs> I want to take a few minutes to talk about biocontrol. And um, you'll see why it's a, an issue near and dear to my heart in a minute. Um, this is also the part of the talk where I try to convince you to love a thistle. And uh, you'll see why. Um, I think it's, it's very tempting to look for a silver bullet when we're dealing with invasive plants. Um, those of you who manage large tracts of land and see them, overwhelmed with things like buckthorn and bush honeysuckle and garlic mustard, wouldn't it be swell if there was something you could release and it would kill them and you wouldn't have to be out there um, using mechanical pulling methods or spraying with um, herbicides. Uh, it would save a lot of money, it would save a lot of time. Um, but the problem with that is often biocontrol agents don't control the plant effectively. And it goes back to that very same demographic modeling I've shown you already. Um, so we looked at this issue. And I like to think about biocontrols um, in the eye of Anna Karenina, which is happy families are all alike and unhappy families are unhappy in their own special way. Um, biocontrol, successful biocontrols are all alike, but they can each fail in their own special way. Um, and some of the ways biocontrols can fail is they don't establish. You release them, they all die. They establish, but they don't reproduce to reach adequate densities. They don't disperse across gaps the way our weeds do. So you might be able to deal with a patch here, but it doesn't spread. It doesn't adequately control the target weed, which is what we're going to focus on. It doesn't die out when the target disappears and it impacts non-target plants. So if it doesn't do any of those things, then you have success. But if it does one of those, you have a failure. Here's the thistle I want you to love. <laughs> this is Pitcher's thistle. Um, it's a threatened native thistle that grows on the sand dunes around Lake Michigan and a little bit over on Lake Huron. And um, it's a wonderful native species that grows out on these dunes. It's a monocarpic perennial, which means it lives 
anywhere from four to eight years, flowers once and dies. It only reproduces by seed, doesn't spread vegetatively, um, and it's an important component in mid-successional sand dunes and stabilizing those dunes and making them resistant to wind and other problems. And so we've been monitoring this species for, um, well, I don't want to tell you how long, over 20 years. Um, and uh, we do demographic monitoring, which means we look at, um, we tag each individual plant and we look at it, put it in these size classes, and then we determine its population growth rate, or in this case, not so growth rate. So here, here's population growth rate, those lambdas of all the populations that we're monitoring. And you can see only that one and that one are above one, and just barely, and all the rest are already in decline. The reason they're in decline, um, many factors, uh, climate change, genetic problems, recreation on the dunes, but the newest threats are these biocontrol weevils, um, shown here, this is Laurinus planus, or the long schnoz weevil, we call them. Um, this one is Rhinocillus conicus, and this one is Cleonus uh, piger. All of these have been promoted and have been distributed as biocontrols for weedy thistles. All of them are now impacting this native thistle and many other native thistles. And uh, they're having a very serious impact. In fact, um, I may outlive Pitcher's thistle at this rate. Um, here's Lorinus planus in a head. So uh, Lorinus and Rhinocillus are both seed weevils. They lay their eggs in the head, the flowering head. Those developing larvae eat the seeds, and then they pupate, and this is one just about ready to emerge. You can see the long schnoz there, its little eyes. It's almost cute, almost, <laughs> not quite. Um, so here is the same kind of graph I've been showing you already um, with population growth rate, but remember, we're already starting just at one. And as we reduce fecundity, you can see how quickly these plants are um, trending to uh, local extinction. Here are the two thistles that those biocontrols were promoted and released to control. So let's just compare these. Um, what, what these weevils do, they eat the seeds, they reduce fecundity by about 50%. So 50% reduction in seed um, of our weeds, they're still, they're still growing. Those populations aren't under control. We go back to this one, 50%. You're declining by 20% each year. So you're a population that's crashing. What this means for our um, native thistle is even under the, the best conditions, the field conditions right now, um, this is approaching extinction. Extinction in this case is one um, by the end of the century. And with any of these other threats, weevils, finches that eat the seeds, inbreeding, um, presence of weeds and other things, you're going to be extinct very, very quickly. This is where I really try to convince you to love this thistle. Um, you might be saying, well, it's just a thistle. You know, what, what's the big deal? We got lots of thistles. Um, but this is a thistle that is really important to the sand dune community. When it blooms in the middle of the summer, there is really nothing else in bloom on the dunes. And because of that, it is the sole nectar source for a whole bunch of bees, butterflies. There are a number of things that eat it. There's spiders that live on it, there are these weevils that are impacting it. Um, so it's really interconnected to a lot of different species, really important. In, in fact, monarchs um, use it as a nectar source um, right as they're about to cross the lake and then again 
when they get across the lake is one of the first things they can nectar on and recover from that long flight. <coughs> so um, this is an important species, and it's going downhill fast. Um, so ironically, two other weevils, also Lorina species, have been approved and are starting to be released to control spotted knapweed. Um, spotted knapweed is a weed of these dune systems, and um, we're worried about them impacting pitcher's thistle. Um, and uh, a graduate student who's defending on Friday found that they can indeed um, uh, damage the floral tissue. The good news is they don't appear to oviposit, lay their eggs in the heads. Um, but again, thinking about this demographically, our modeling, okay, here's hard to see, number one there is spotted knapweed. Our modeling shows that in order for something to control spotted knapweed, you need to be taking out at least 80% of the seeds. Uh, these weevils don't, so they're not effective. Under the best scenario, they're going to take centuries to really get um, uh, spotted knapweed under control, so why are we risking the release of these agents that aren't effective and could potentially have um, other effects. So the take home messages on this, um, that uh, the Lorinus planus and other biocontrols are driving Circium pitcheri to extinction. Um, other Lorinus are being released um, as biocontrols. And I think most importantly, here, when we're thinking about biocontrols, we should have some evidence that they're going to be effective. We shouldn't be thinking about using them if they're not going to be effective. But most importantly, what it takes to bring a weed under control is much greater than what it takes to drive an already rare plant to extinction. And because of the host jumping that we see so frequently, the unintended impacts of these um, can be really catastrophic. So um, I'm happy to send you um, any of the publications uh, resulting from this work. If you can't um, scribble them down fast enough, um, they're the invasive um, references. And I want to thank all my collaborators and co-authors. <laughs>